Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we pray that my words this morning would be your words, that you would open our hearts and our minds so that we would hear your word afresh. Amen. I love preaching at the beginning of the year. Um, actually, it's the first time I've done it, but it's like, oh, <laughs> clean slate. Um, I'm not going to give you an awful joke like I did last time I preached. Um, but I wonder how 2018 was for you. At the end of a year, I like to think back on everything that has happened in that year. Now, it first started as a kind of Facebook thing, and to be honest, it was more of a show-off of everywhere I travelled in 2013. But since then, it's become more of a spiritual journey for me to look back at where God was in the previous 12 months so that I can feel more confident about where he's going to be with me into, in the next year. So 2018 was quite a big year for me. I turned 30 and um, Isabel turned two, so we're like, wow, we've survived parenthood for two years. And I was recommended for training in the Church of England. So it was a, a year of waiting and great anticipation and what I'd hoped for, but yet not really dared believe, um, was affirmed as I started training in the Church of England. So it was a good year for me, but maybe not for all of us. Perhaps you felt like your year was quite grueling. Like Mary and Joseph on that first Christmas, the journey was hard, and yet you're still here in a new year. And just like Mary and Joseph, who plodded on, you may find peace in a new year. So it's healthy to look back on what the year has held for us so we can go with confidence into that new year. So last year I preached in Lent and I announced that my husband, Barry, was giving up chocolate, sweets and biscuits for the entirety of the year. And I'm pleased to announce that he has made it. There was a slight incident at the borough in Lancaster where the chef accidentally put chocolate sauce instead of toffee sauce on his sticky toffee pudding, despite having been told about Barry's challenge. But he did it. He resolved to do something quite challenging and he managed it, despite temptation and frustration and a little bit of suspected foul play, he did it. Rather like those in our reading this morning. In our gospel, we are introduced finally to the Magi from the East, or our wise men, or three kings, as you may know them. Though we don't know that there were three, there may have been more, we do know from our reading that they too set out on a greatly challenging journey probably more so than my husband giving up chocolate for a year. And they, met, they were met with temptation, frustration, and attempted foul play. So what do we know then from our reading? We know in first verse that the wise men arrived in Jerusalem after Jesus was born. They didn't arrive in Bethlehem, where this king they were seeking actually was. And so the Magi's challenging journey was also one of surprises. We know that whilst a new baby brings curiosity, it doesn't necessarily bring visitors from far away unless they are perhaps family or close friends. This points to Jesus' royalty, as we also know that a royal family would await visits from across the kingdom and further afield. If someone didn't turn up to pay homage to your new child, it would be seen as a slight against you. When I think of this, I think of the Disney classic, The Lion King, in which Simba, the lion cub, and the heir to the throne, the son of the king, is um, proudly lifted up and presented for his first appearance to the entire pride land and kingdom. And while it's not factually correct, because I'm sure that all the animals don't gather every time a new lion cub is born, um, it does present a, a good picture for us this morning. 
all the animals in the kingdom are there to greet him and to bow down to show respect and honour, except for one, his uncle, Scar, who is less than pleased that his older brother has produced um, an heir to the throne. And so we see that if you want to show respect to royalty, you turn up. The Magi's challenging and surprising journey was also one about showing honour and respect. We know that when the Magi arrived in Jerusalem and began asking around, words soon reached King Herod, the man who had been appointed king of the Jews by the Roman authorities. Can you imagine, you're the king of the Jews and somebody turns up and asks, where's the new king of the Jews? I think when it says all of Jerusalem, I find it hard to believe that the entire city was terrified. Instead of all Jewish people being afraid, I think it more likely that Matthew means the royal we, the Jewish leadership, those in authority, those who had something to fear by a new king coming. The Magi's challenging and surprising, honouring journey was also one of fear. And we see in verses four to six that Herod required evidence so he could make sense of what was being said. We know that through this evidence, Herod is given a frame of reference for the child he wants to find. Because later in Matthew, he orders the death of all the boys in the area who are under two years old. So it is reasonable to conclude that the Magi had been traveling for two years. The Magi's challenging, surprising, honoring journey that brought fear was also one of danger. And from verse seven, we begin to see Herod's fear and insecurity begin to work itself out into action. He begins a manipulation in order that he might find this new king and put an end to it. Herod's own desire to have power leads him to do the unthinkable, like killing the vulnerable. And it seems rather extreme, but I wonder how many times we have put our own desires or insecurities above others to their detriment. It's reasonable to assume from this text that the star appeared in the night sky above Bethlehem at the moment Jesus was born and then disappeared again. In the school's Chris Dingle service back in December last year, the children sang of the star. They sang, oh, and love shone down over the hills and over the valleys. Oh, and love shone down over the world. I found the imagery of that so poignant, it really stayed with me for the whole of Advent, that Jesus' birth delighted his heavenly father so much that he couldn't help but show off with the biggest and brightest star in the sky. That was quite a romantic idea, and it's probably not you know, what actually happened, but for me, it's a beautiful image. That same star of love appears again in verse eight, just as the Magi needs some guidance. At this point, I'd like to say just how, much, how this part of the story, not this specific part of the story, this verse, but this part of the story, the Magi, never ceases to amaze me. It was this group of men who weren't Jewish or even from the area, and they chose to make a significantly challenging and costly journey they could have decided in Jerusalem that they had been mistaken. And yet they trusted in a star sent by a God that they probably didn't believe in. And what happens next is astonishing. Verse 10 says, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed, jubilant, rapturous, euphoric, exultant, these are all words which come up when you look for synonyms of the word overjoyed. I wonder when the last time was that you felt overjoyed. For me, the closest feeling of over, feeling really joyful 
um, happened on New Year's Day when we took Isabel, my uh, almost three-year-old, ice skating for the first time. Now, neither Barry or I are very good at ice skating, um, so we planned to hire a, a penguin aid thing that you can kind of push around and lean on and she could sit on it. And that was great because it meant that I wouldn't fall over. But Isabel um, is very independent and she insisted that she could stand up and push this penguin round. So there we had both parents, neither very good at ice skating, trying to support a toddler who's never even stood on ice, <laughs> pushing a penguin aid. But her face was filled with delight. And as she got better and better, she grew more confident and looked even happier. Watching that face of enjoyment gave me a really deep sense of joy. So I wonder how much more then the Magi felt when they saw the star. They had set out on their challenging and dangerous journey and had no doubt been disappointed in Jerusalem when they arrived and were met with suspicion and manipulation. They had been given the next clue, Bethlehem. But really, it would be like looking for a needle in a haystack. They weren't given an address, they were just given the name of a place. And their journey had hit a dead end until the star reappeared. That same star of heavenly grandeur and love. Suddenly, their journey was one of joy and hope as they hurried to greet the new king. So they arrive and the Magi enter the house and see Mary with Jesus and they kneel down and worship him. Imagine the scene. By entering the house, the Magi likely walked into a courtyard with rooms opened off from. I spent quite a lot of time googling what first century um, Nazarene houses would have looked like. If they had arrived in the daytime, they would have likely found Mary in the courtyard doing jobs and they would have found Jesus doing what two-year-olds do, toddling around, making noise, getting dirty, eating things off the floor. But as it happens, they were led by a star and so the family would have likely been inside for the night. Jesus was probably still doing what toddlers do. In the Magi I walked into an ordinary house with an ordinary family. They had come from the king's courts in Jerusalem, from really great grandness. And yet, as they arrived in this humble home with this humble family, they recognised the child, a toddler, probably dirty and noisy, and they recognised him as king. And whilst they may have set out on their journey to see a new king, they now saw the face of God. They offered him the gifts they had brought, gold, frankincense and myrrh. Upon kneeling, whilst feeling overwhelmed with joy, the Magi offered this toddler king. It's, it's amazing to wrap your head around a toddler king. I look at my daughter and I think, that's just bonkers. And they offered him the gifts they had brought with him. They came prepared to show this king respect and honour with gifts fit for his status. Gold for his kingship. Frankincense because of his priesthood. And myrrh. Well, in ancient times, myrrh was a valuable commodity used as incense, but also as perfume and medicine. And myrrh was commonly used, especially in Egypt, in the process of embalming. I cannot help but wonder what drew the Magi to choose a substance used in death as a present for the new king. <coughs> Sorry. After all, we know Jesus was embalmed with myrrh at his death, as it says in John 19. We sang the carol earlier, we three kings, we sang the words, myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume, breathes of life of gathering gloom. Sorrowing, 
sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in the stone-cold tomb. Glorious now, behold him arise, King and God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, earth to heaven replies. I ask Beth for this carol because I love it. And whilst it's a Christmas carol, you could be forgiven for thinking you could sing it at Easter. It's the moment when the present gift looks towards the future sacrifice. And it serves as a reminder to us that Jesus did not come to live an ordinary life. He came to die for us. He came to die for our sins. He came to die so we might live. So as we begin our journey from stable to tomb, we turn our eyes away from this sweet baby in the manger towards the pain-wrought face of a dying man and his words, it is finished. These wise men, the kings, the magi, whatever you would like to call them, they undertook a challenging and dangerous journey and were greeted with the face of God himself. They brought gifts fit for a heavenly king and they could not help but worship him. During Advent, I read through Luke's gospel and what jumped out to me was that time and time again, people met Jesus and they worshiped him. Jesus performed miracles and they worshiped him. Jesus took the time to listen and they worshipped him. When people come face to face with God himself, whether he is a toddler or a man, they cannot help but worship him. So what does that mean for us at the beginning of this new year? Well, for me, I think it means we just have to worship him in everything we do whether it's here in church through singing or praying or taking part in communion, whether it's in our work, whether it's how we speak to people, how we drive our car, how we shop, everything we do is worship to him. What then can we do but pour out our whole lives as a living sacrifice? or a living worship to him. As it says in the other carol, we're not singing today, what can I give him, poor as I am? If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can I give him, give my heart.